So uh, our next speaker is someone that uh, has spoken here before, and um, all of you have received his talk uh, and talks um, very well. So he's agreed to come back. It's Professor, uh, Associate Professor Sanjay Raghav. Uh, he's a senior consultant neurologist at Monash Health and Peninsula Health, where he runs movement disorder programs, and he's the director at Dandenong Neurology. He's assigned supervisor and mentor to the uh, Royal Australasian College of Physician Trainees. He has got a special interest in movement disorders, which include tremors, Parkinson's disease, tics, dystonia, and Huntington's disease. In addition, he's involved in several research projects related to movement disorders at RMIT and Monash University. Several of his research papers and articles have been published in esteemed peer review medical journals, and he has presented at national and international conferences. He's actively involved in teaching and training of neurology registrars and fellows, and he's also a fellow of the American Academy of Neurology. Also, another string to his bow is he is a level two yoga teacher who has developed a special yoga and wellness program for Parkinson's patients and conducts weekly yoga and mindfulness classes. He is a visiting professor at S. Vyasa Yoga University in Bengaluru, India. He has integrated yoga, mindfulness, Ayurveda, and naturopathy with mainstream medicine. He enjoys teaching patients and public how to enrich their lives with holistic living through a variety of workshops and seminars. So I'm sure his uh, talk will be equally enthralling. So please join me in welcoming Sanjay. Thank you, Arup, for inviting me to this esteemed presence of people who are here to listen. and. I don't know how much you are still awake to listen to me, because postprandial I feel very drowsy, and you know, towards the end of the day, it looks like it looks too hard to focus. Maybe I thought the dancing stuff should have been done before my one, so you know, you would be more awake. But anyway, so you can raise any your hand uh, in between or at the end if the questions are. So I'm happy to answer whatever I can. So if we go through uh, what um, I'm going to talk about is holistic approach. Holistic doesn't mean that you stop taking your tablets or you don't see Dr. Meena Ghali for focused ultrasound therapy. You can do all those things and you can still do yoga and meditation. And I, I, and I think uh, it works better because if you uh, work with your body and mind in the best possible way, the symptoms are decreased, and that, that means that you need less medications and less side effects. So to make you understand what is integrative medicine framework, we have evidence-based therapies. Uh, conventional medicine, taking your levodopa, dopamine agonist, and other medications. Complementary medicine is like acupuncture, herbal medicines, um, Chinese medicine, or something else. So they can also be evidence-based. And the third thing which I'm going to talk about is lifestyle medicine. Lifestyle is what you can do with your body and uh, how you can change your own uh, way of living, which can help you with Parkinson's disease. So if you combine all of them together, it is known as holistic approach. And this is the way you can have your own informed choices. So if you look into lifestyle medicine, it is not complementary medicine, alternative medicine, it is self-care. And uh, you can take your own lifestyle choices which you want to um, change in your lifestyle and it can contribute to your health, your healing and well-being goals, not just Parkinson's disease but in general as well. So you definitely have to do something about it. It's not just taking a pill and everything is gone. So it is not a new medicine, like nowadays you can see there's a Lifestyle Medicine Society of Australia, Australasia, and American and world. But this is always the case, even Hippocrates who was there um, in 450 BC, um, who is considered to be the father of modern medicine, is also father of lifestyle medicine. Because uh, he found that the disease starts from gut, walking is the best medicine, and uh, food can be your medicine. So. Uh, these are all important things which we are following up since then. So how 
Parkinson disease is a lifestyle disease. I, uh, this is a very interesting paper I read uh, a few years ago, and um, one thing about Parkinson's disease is it's only specific to human beings. It's not seen in animals, not in birds, or uh, not in any other uh, species. And um, there's a theory behind it that there's an evolutionary bottleneck because the way the nigrostriatal axons arborization is, you compare to any species, it's like 500 to 900 times more uh, very dense network in basal ganglia and which leads to prone to oxidative stress rather than other parts of the brain. So there's an overload of arborization or branching in this area. Now, prevalence of Parkinson disease has definitely increased. If you see old papers from uh, James Parkinson and Galen and all, they have not taken like more than a dozen cases in their lifetime. And I'm pretty sure that all the neurologists, we have seen few hundred, if not thousand. So that means there is an epidemic of Parkinson's disease in last, I would say, in 200 years. Now, what could be the reason? One of the reasons could be higher life expectancy. We are living longer. And that's why, it, as we know, it's mostly the disease of old age. The second is, and which is more important, is change in our lifestyle. So our ancestors were hunter-gatherers, they were running around, there was a lot of physical exercise. And maybe there's a dramatic reduction in the amount of physical exercise what we do. And we all know that the brain releases uh, neurotrophic factors like brain-derived neurotrophic factor, uh, which is related with, uh, with exercise and running and uh, being active physically. So maybe sedentary lifestyle is one of the reasons why it is more common. And uh, thirdly, there is more exposure to toxins, uh, increased stress levels, and bad food habits. So this uh, diagram shows how we have changed from hunter-gatherer activity to sitting in our house, having a home office, and, um, and even our paintings have changed depicting how we live. And you can see in the middle one how the nigrostyleton neuron arborization has increased in over time and how this uh, basal ganglia network is uh, more prone to oxidative stress. So if you look into uh, how lifestyle changes can improve your Parkinson's disease, first step is towards preventing Parkinson's disease progression. And that's what we have learned from epidemiological studies, that what are the factors which make one more prone to Parkinson's disease. Current treatments do not reverse the disease, primarily address the motor and non-motor symptoms. And there's a good evidence that lifestyle factors may modify Parkinson's symptom progression. There's evidence from observational studies for a role of environmental exposure and lifestyle habits in modulating the risk of Parkinson's. And, and there's a lot of interest in the last 10, 15 years that the disease might start from the gut. So what happens when you make your lifestyle changes? There is feeling of empowerment that you have something in your hand, not in your doctor's hand. You stay motivated. There is a motivation. There is a purpose to live. And you can delay the progression of disease. You can be having an adaptive lifestyle for the new challenges. Just for an example, when I take yoga class, I teach them how to improve their balance. And some patients uh, counter question that I have no balance issues. Why you are training us for the balance? I said because we are working way ahead than what is going to come in let's say five years or ten years. So that is what I say outpace Parkinson's disease. You outpace. You do better than what Parkinson's can bring in few years time. So it is good for symptom management. You need less medications and less side effects. So what are the factors which can outpace your Parkinson's. One of them, I believe, is diet nutrition, which is a very controversial topic. Most of the people don't even address this, and they say, have a good nutrition, have good protein and carbs, but I'll, I'll delve on to this. Gut health is a big thing, because in the last 10, 15 years, we are finding that the disease might start from the gut. And exercise, I think Professor Jennifer McKinley has already spoken about it, so I'll not speak much about it, but there's a lot of evidence. Exercise is one of the things which is neuroprotective against Parkinson's disease. Stress reduction is important. Um, we all know when we are stressed out, the tremor gets worse, the balance is bad, and we don't feel good. So stress reduction definitely helps in Parkinson's disease. 
and that's why we use meditation. Environment, we know there are things in environment which can lead to Parkinson's, but I also believe that if you can change that environment, maybe having a filtered water or not using that same environment in which it might have led to Parkinson's, changing the environment will decrease your toxin overload. Social connectedness is important because uh, it is being found that people who are socially connected, who have all the help around, their Parkinson's does not deteriorate that fast. Cognition and again doing crossword Sudoku and all those sorts of things can help for you not to get into Parkinson's dementia. And I think uh, this morning there was a talk on cognition and Parkinson's disease. Mental health, um, keeping your uh, other things like 50% of Parkinson's patients can have depression, so having depression under control. In our Parkinson's clinics in the public hospital system like Monash, we sometimes see only pure depressed patients which look, they look like Parkinson's disease. And they already went being commenced on um, Parkinson's medication because there's a flat effect on there and the body movements are less. And so definitely this is one of the big factors which is a differential and as well as 50% of Parkinson's patients can have uh, depression. Sleep is very important thing in Parkinson's disease and so many patients have sleep disorders. Staying positive, staying motivated is important and preventing falls. There can be more points which I will pick up but these are the main ones which we'll be discussing today. So when there is a problem, you can treat the symptoms or you can go to the cause and try to fix the problem. So uh, this is what the lifestyle changes means that you are trying to fix where the problem is. So if you look into the choices, let's see whatever is offered you today and whatever you think works for you, you can, you can pick up that and make your choice. So apply proven and research lifestyle medicine choices, empower your own healing, and um, choose the course of action you want to take. So I take you as you are on the driving seat of your recovery bus, and you can, you can pick up whatever works for you. I'll, um, I'll try to make you understand what epigenetics is. I think we all know about genes. So epi means something above genes. It is something which makes a gene trigger or on or off. And in studies uh, in recent last 10, 15 years, we have found that environmental factors plays a big role in triggering a bad gene. Let's say someone is born with a gene which can lead to Parkinson's disease, but it needs the right environment for that gene to trigger on. And if you keep your environment in a way that you are not prone to that disease because of environmental insult or an infection or your lifestyle, you can uh, be delaying the disease or you can prevent the disease. So epigenetics, there's growing evidence that environmental factors can work on gene regulation in Parkinson's disease. And uh, there are different uh, ways by which it works. The most commonly studied in Parkinson's is DNA methylation, by which there can be change in genes. So it is like a switch button uh, on and off. And uh, if you can change your lifestyle factors, you can, uh, you can prevent Parkinson's disease. And then there are more studies on that. Keep going. So epigenetic modulation of gene expression by environmental factors is emerging as an important mechanism in both positive and negative way. If you see the negative ones are dairy in nutrition, pesticides like parakeets, and trichloroethylene is found to be uh, leading to Parkinson's disease, heavy metals like copper, manganese, and lead. And positive, from various epidemiological studies we have found is coffee, tobacco. Vitamin E is again found in epidemiological studies, but when you are giving tocopherol, it doesn't really improve your Parkinson's disease. Maybe in the long run it might, and also exercise is beneficial. So we don't know how much these factors works and, and to what extent. But switching over to good lifestyle practices can help to switch off bad genes. And more research is needed in this field which is going on, looking for the epigenetic biomarkers and looking into different lifestyle and environmental factors which affect Parkinson's disease. 
So this is a, a, a diagram showing what are the different things which can affect Parkinson's disease, um, which has been proven to affect Parkinson's disease in negative and positive ways both. Positive is tobacco, exercise, plasma, uric acid levels, coffee, and levodopa therapy and other medications. Um, uh, while pesticide, dairy consumption, increased stress levels, traumatic brain injury, and organic solvents and heavy metals can lead to Parkinson's. So uh, some of them have been again um, uh, written, uh, but there are a couple of which were missed was uh, gut health, like constipation can, uh, can be a very big risk factor. It can be 10 to 15 years before you have Parkinson's motor symptoms, there can be chronic constipation. History of melanoma is also a, a risk factor. Next one. And the way all these potential triggers works is they affect the gut and then the, from the vagal nerve, it affects the brain and, and leads to oxidative stress, inflammation, mitochondrial dysfunction, which we know is affected in Parkinson's disease. This leads to alpha synuclear aggregation and uh, the normal brain becomes a diseased Parkinson's brain with widespread Levy pathology. Another concept which I want to explain you is uh, like a shoelace and the top of the shoelace is uh, a cap. So it's like, that's what the telomeres are. Okay, I can. So telomeres are the caps on the top of the chromosomes. The bigger the telomeres, that means you are more protective. It is uh, like in aging, we have studied a lot about if there is a shorter telomere length, that means chances are you will die early. So they have studied telomeres in Parkinson's disease as well. So it is being found that telomeres in buccal epithelial cells were found to be shorter in Parkinson's than in control group. And they also found that using various lifestyle changes and uh, therapeutic strategies have increased to telomerase activation, which is the enzyme which increases the telomere length. And that means the lifestyle changes can make a real change in Parkinson's disease. Next one. So lifestyle modifications uh, definitely works uh, in your favor. And how can you make this uh, telomere uh, length longer? By stress reduction, optimal weight, exercise, stop smoking and decreasing your alcohol consumption, healthy balanced diet. And um, in some studies they have found uh, some supplements which can work for that. So if we want to apply these changes in our lifestyle, and the issue is about the relapses. So first you know what helps in Parkinson's disease. You contemplate on it, you think about it, and then you prepare yourself with the tips and whatever information you can gather. You take action, you try to maintain, but the problem comes in relapse. And to avoid this relapse, you need constant motivation. So attending to local, your Parkinson's groups can be very helpful, and um, being in touch with other people and your therapist is very important. Talking about various factors, stress has been found to be one of the risk factors for Parkinson's disease via direct neurotoxic effect. Major stressors, we have all diagnosed Parkinson's disease um, when patients have a big trauma in their life, um, a separation, someone died at home, or even you know selling a house. So it depends what stresses you and that, and it's not a coincidence that you see the first symptom arising with some sort of tragedy. And uh, a positive relationship between the number of life stressors and risk of Parkinson's in case control studies have been seen. So stress can contribute to development of Parkinson's, depression can make Parkinson's symptoms worse. And it's being found that cortisol levels are high in Parkinson's uh, disease patients. Cortisol is a stress hormone and high cortisol level means that there is uh, stress underlying. Acute treatment, when we give even levodopa therapy, has found to reduce plasma cortisol levels in Parkinson's disease patients, which uh, gives us uh, uh, indirect um, evidence that there is a, there's a connection between dopamine hyperfunction and hypothalamopituitary axis hyperactivity. 
And um, emotional stress can transitively increase Parkinson's symptoms. We all know that tremor get works with anxiety and stress. Next one. So chronic stress uh, works in uh, different ways. It can uh, lead to decreased uh, neurogenesis or uh, building of new uh, neural networks in the brain. It can lead to uh, increased stress leads to increased activity at the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, increased neural inflammation, increased neurodegeneration, and increased oxidative stress. So uh, in one of these studies, they found the effects of mindfulness meditation exercise program on symptoms and quality of life in Parkinson's patients. There was decrease not just in the depression and anxiety, but there was also improvement in the motor functions in, in this study. Sleep was better, cognition was better in this, this group of patients who had mindfulness-based exercises. So how it helps in Parkinson's? It helps uh, in decreasing stress, improving sleep, improving pain management, decreasing depression, anxiety, improves our ability to cope, helps in general well-being. There's more clarity about what we are doing and also acceptance. I believe acceptance is a very big thing in Parkinson's disease. Sometimes I see patients four, five, six years after the diagnosis and they have not accepted the diagnosis. They are hiding from their friends. They are not telling people. I'm not saying that you have to tell everyone, but sometimes when we don't accept, we don't move forward, and we try not to get involved in various things which can help you. So mindfulness-based uh, intervention in Parkinson's, we also have a structural uh, evidence how it changes the brain. In this study, they had uh, two groups. One had mindfulness. The other were doing just the normal exercise program. And they found that the part of the brain which are affected in Parkinson's disease had increased gray matter density after having uh, six weeks of mindfulness program, while the other group had increased gray matter density in cerebellum. Now, cerebellum is another part of the brain which helps in balance. So when the basal ganglia is involved in Parkinson's, it is the cerebellum which can help you. And I always tell my Parkinson's patients who love their red and they want to drink few, have few drinks every night. I said, look, one thing is gone because of Parkinson's. One thing you can preserve your cerebellum. So decrease, decreasing your alcohol intake can definitely help you. So these are the two figures um, on the right side. You can see it's, it's a very busy slide, but... Uh, what it's trying to show is that there's an increase in the gray matter density in the parts which are affected in Parkinson's disease after they were uh, subjected to mindfulness. While on this other side, you can see the cerebellum is bigger in size as compared to uh, the normal controls. So with meditation, you can decrease inflammation, stress hormones, increase melatonin, which is deficient in Parkinson's disease, and that affects our sleep. It also improves genetic repair, and uh, it helps to ability to cope, and also decreases our pain and uh, decreases our stress levels, depression, and anxiety. Uh, I think exercise has been already uh, dealt with, and um, there are only benefits in doing exercise on a regular basis. I would say whatever exercise works for you, you just do it. There's no specific exercise which is found to be better than others, but and it is the only thing which is 100% neuroprotective. So it delays progression of your Parkinson's disease, but do it daily. So it is the best medicine. There's a lot of evidence for it, uh, and you can pick up whatever works for you, cycling, boxing, dancing, tai chi, golfing, whatever works for you. But I'll just keep going. And then there's more um, animal models and uh, various uh, trials and... Uh, which have found that how it works mostly by brain-derived neurotrophic factor is increased when you do exercise. And um, the best exercises, which is more vigorous, and uh, if you can do it on a regular basis. I'll keep going. And um, I teach yoga, and I'll uh, try to explain you why I teach yoga in Parkinson's disease. So let me just keep going. So yoga has three components. One is different postures, which are uh, traditionally called as asanas. And these helps to decrease stiffness, improve your flexibility, mobility, and range of movement. 
Some of them also help with constipation. The second component of yoga is uh, breathing exercises, which is known as pranayam. This, in, in yoga, we know that breath and mind goes together. If you can control your breath, you can control your mind. When we are stressed, our breath is shallow and fast. And when we are cool, calm, composed, our breathing is slow and deep. So uh, you can control your mind indirectly by controlling your breath. This helps with tremor, fatigue, improving your sleep, and your uh, mental health issues. The third component of uh, yoga is meditation. And meditation helps, again, to decrease your mental health issues, but also in builds up your resilience and uh, coping mechanisms and uh, accepting things in, a, in the most beautiful way. So there is a lot of research in yoga. This paper came uh, a few years ago, but it was a good study in which there were, this was from Hong Kong. They had 187 Parkinson's patients who were doing mindfulness yoga. And uh, it was delivered in 90 minutes um, and uh, given for eight weeks. And they found not just the anxiety and depression, but the uh, motor scores on UPDRS also improved. And, um, and this is the reason why I believe yoga, because it's mind, body, both. There was increased effect of mindfulness yoga at follow-up regarding their psycho-spiritual outcomes, contrasted with the findings of uh, other studies with dance therapy and qigong. And then these are various papers which were looking into uh, how yoga was helping in Parkinson's patients, improving flexibility, strength, gait, quality of life, uh, along with their mental health issues. And some more studies next. And next. So uh, in a nutshell, how yoga helps in Parkinson's? It helps in visible reduction in tremors, improves your gait, improves control of body movements, improves mobility and range of movement, balance, reduces depression, anxiety, reduces stiffness, and mainly it improves your sleep. And um, mindfulness, which is part of it, so you get all the benefits of meditation. Um, fainting spells, um, this is something which I see very commonly, so I thought I'll just quickly talk about fainting. Now, fainting happens because of Parkinson's disease itself, or it can be a very red flag sign. In early Parkinson's disease, it could be something like multisystem atrophy in which there is a drop in blood pressure when you stand. And, uh, and I, I think this is an important thing to understand that uh, if too much of fainting even before your diagnosis, it could not be, it could be something else like MSA, multisystem atrophy. But one thing which I want to tell you about these fainting which I uh, do is that I ask patients to drink uh, lukewarm water early morning empty stomach that is found to be very effective in orthostatic hypotension. The second thing it works is in constipation. When you, when you drink uh, early morning uh, water and then you don't eat anything for next hour or so, it helps with your constipation as well. But then there are other things which you can do if you are having disease spells. One of them is to have uh, smaller meals, shorter meals rather than big meal because big meal brings all the blood to digest that food and you can feel dizzy. Um, and then getting up slowly from the chair, doing some leg exercises. In past, we used to give pressure stockings like leg stockings, but uh, in recent uh, few trials, they have found that it is not that effective. Uh, though abdominal binders are better in that sense. So you can, you can also look into other things like when you have a nap in daytime, keep your head in a little bit up. So that helps to prevent uh, disease spells in daytime. Another thing is uh, avoiding heat exposure or prolonged standing or moving your legs when you are standing or sitting cross legs. So you, when you get up, there's not much pooling of the uh, blood in your legs because calf is a second heart. If you do leg exercises, you can bring the, that blood back to, towards brain. Otherwise, you might feel dizzy. And obviously, there are medications which can be tried. 
one of the medications which is the most effective is not available in Australia. Um, if I'm correct, Droxidopa, I have never seen. You can get from a special excess scheme, but it is a very good. Usually we give Domperidone along with our Levodopa, which works, increasing water intake. And if you don't have blood pressure issues, maybe increasing salt intake can help. So uh, using adaptive equipments uh, for various uh, reasons can be used. I'll just leave it because it is more of an OT thing. But all these things are comes into lifestyle, you know, having protective gears around, rope at the side of bed. If you have rolling over problem, you can have um, uh, satin pajamas so you can easily turn over in the bed. And using an electric shaver rather than uh, um, safety razor can be helpful and using sticks, wheelie walkers, and things like that. I'll talk about gut because gut has a lot of interest uh, in Parkinson's disease recently. Uh, there's an increasing amount of evidence uh, that possibly Parkinson starts from gut. High prevalence of GI symptoms in, in Parkinson's patients like constipation can be there even a decade before other symptoms. And in various studies, it's being found that even before uh, alpha synuclein is seen in brain, it is seen in gut. Uh, there is an uh, increased gut permeability with the load of alpha synuclein in, in early Parkinson's patients. And it is also being known that enteric nervous system is exposed to toxic substances. And uh, this is also linked to high level of alpha synuclein in the brain in Parkinson's patients. So there is a Brack and Brack is, uh, staging uh, in, um, uh, from Frankfurt who has done a lot of, uh, and his theory is that the disease starts from the gut and through the vagal nerve it goes to the brain. That's why people have loss of sense of smell and then they have motor symptoms at the end. There can be cognitive involvement as, uh, as the disease spreads to the gray matter. So the other uh, thing is gut-brain microbiota. So microbes which lives in our body also plays a role in uh, Parkinson's disease and they uh, have a big role in gut-brain access. The gut microbiota can modulate brain functions through the bi-directional interactions between intestine and nervous system. Because we need to know that enteric nervous system is like a second brain. There are a lot of neurons there and there is also dopamine in gut. So recognition of uh, this axis um, is involved uh, primarily or secondly in Parkinson's disease and are also other neurological disorders. So there are various disorders which are being in implicated by this gut-brain axis, uh, including mental health issues, MS, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, of course, and functional gut disorders and even autism and schizophrenia and metabolic disorders. <coughs> so dysregulation in the microbiota could lead to factors that can affect Parkinson's disease. And it is being seen in studies that there is a different type of colonic um, microbiota in Parkinson's patients as compared to controls. Even some of them have gone to an extent that they have found that there is a different abundance of enterobacteriaceae seen in people who have postural instability and get difficulty. So they think that if we change the intestinal microbiome, it can also improve your Parkinson's disease. Uh, so the significant association between the composition of the gut microbes and the Parkinson's systems have been looked into. And uh, recent data suggests that um, a specific bacterial family together with constipation uh, is more highly sensitive, and they are also thinking of creating a diagnostic criteria or a biomarker for Parkinson's disease. So what should we do in a nutshell uh, to improve our gut health? We can look to manage constipation, which is important, and uh, going for things which are prebiotics, probiotics, making dietary modifications, uh, so beneficially impacting our intestinal barrier integrity could be very effective in Parkinson's management. Now coming to the food, uh, what type of foods you should avoid? So avoid all the problem foods. Problem foods are the ones which are giving rise to constipation or altered bowel habits and each to his own. Everyone has different, someone might be having lactose intolerance or fructose intolerance, trying to avoid those foods. 
One thing about in Parkinson's disease is uh, protein intake. Because I always tell to take the tablet's empty stomach, and when you take it along with the food, especially if you have a high protein diet, it uh, delays or sometimes it does not allow the uh, levodopa to be absorbed from the gut. The reason is it's the same carriers which uh, helps protein to get transferred into the body, which levodopa also uses. So either you take your tablet's empty stomach, or uh, you wait for a couple of hours before you take your medications. If you are having constipation, then that uh, delay should be a bit longer. So there is no special diet for Parkinson's patients. Um, people have studied Mediterranean diets, which they think uh, is better. But it is being found that the berries, cherries, all these which have flavonoids are really good for Parkinson's as they uh, have uh, antioxidants, and antioxidants are neuroprotective. Eating whole grain, fresh fruits, uh, locally produced foods, and uh, organic maybe uh, to avoid any pesticides or chemicals in it is the best approach. Uh, and the fibers, uh, food which are rich in fiber, as constipation we know is a big issue in Parkinson's disease. So there was a study done um, in almost uh, 50,000 men and 80,000 women over the course of 22 years. And they found that intake of flavonoids um, um, helped to prevent Parkinson's disease. So eating all these colored fruits is good. So plant-based diet is protective. It is protective not just for Parkinson's, but a lot of other disorders also, even uh, cancers and all. How much time? Okay. So I'll keep going, but uh, meat products have been associated in epidemiological studies with increased PD incidence. And uh, the products which are good are fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, olive oil, wine, coconut, and all these things which are found to lower the disease progression. And this is just showing things which uh, affect our Parkinson's disease. Next. So canned foods, um, look, if you look into the f all the food and dietary, then it all comes from different epidemiological studies. We can't create, it's so hard to create a different diet and then checking people for 10, 20 years. What, but from these studies, we have found that what is more a risk factor for Parkinson's disease? Canned food definitely is because of bisphenol A. Fried foods, I'll just keep going because I've been told there's not much time left. Keep going. Diet soda is not good. Dairy, I would like to tell about dairy. Dairy food intake and risk of Parkinson's disease has been uh, implicated in various studies, and I'll give you the reason in the next slide. So uh, what happens is uh, dairy decreases the uric acid levels, and uric acid is found to be neuroprotective. Lactose intolerance because of dairy can lead to intestinal inflammation, increased gut permeability, and Maybe the toxin can reach to the brain, whatever is causing Parkinson's disease. Also, in dairy, there can be pesticides and other contaminants which can lead to it. And also, the bovine microbes which comes along with the um, milk can lead to bacterial overgrowth symptoms and uh, other, uh, and killing the good intestinal flora. So there are various reasons implicated in Parkinson's disease due to increased dairy products. Next. And then uh, I'll just uh, skip. This is about the exosomes in the dairy, which can lead to Parkinson's disease and showing how it works. Next. So coffee is good for Parkinson's. If this is the tea time, I would suggest you should have a black coffee. It is really good for Parkinson's. Not just one study, but there are several studies which has found that ca caffeine is, is quite good for Parkinson's. It says it's, uh, prevents you from the risk. Next. Uh, smoking is found to decreasing the risk of Parkinson's disease. Maybe they die young, I don't know. <laughs> but, um, but the studies have also seen that if you keep smoking after your diagnosis, it is accelerates your Parkinson's disease rather than slowing the clinical progression. So if you are a smoker and you have been diagnosed with Parkinson's, it's time to stop it. And um, there were studies done uh, with nicotine patch which have not found it to be neuroprotective. Next. 
Turmeric is good. Turmeric is very good for not just for Parkinson's, for Alzheimer's, for neuroinflammation. People have pain issues in Parkinson's and it works really well in various different modes like antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and it crosses the blood-brain barrier if, um, and, and it needs to be taken with other things like uh, having a proper Indian curry is a better idea to take because pure turmeric doesn't enter the system Otherwise, you have to mix with black pepper or something else. And the active ingredient is curcumin in it, which is very effective. So I'll keep going. There are a lot of studies which have proven without doubt that curcumin in Parkinson's disease is very good. Keep going. Vitamin D in studies have found to be helpful and low levels have been found in various studies in Parkinson's disease. And iron, this is an important thing. A lot of people love to take supplements and I'm dead against taking supplements on a regular basis. And a lot of these supplements have iron in it. And iron is not good for Parkinson's patients if their levels are normal. Because there is an increased iron deposition in substantia nigra and also in basal ganglia in Parkinson's disease patients. And I think that is one of the reasons why red meat, high red meat consumption is associated with PD progression, maybe because of high iron con content. Keep going. So cardiovascular risk factors are also related with Parkinson's. We know diabetes, heart issues, hypertension. They all lead to uh, deep white matter ischemic changes in the brain, leukoariosis, which makes Parkinson's disease worse. So controlling your metabolic syndromes like diabetes, high cholesterol, hypertension, they all help with Parkinson's disease as well. And then there are other risk factors. Uh, found in studies and, uh, you know, the water, if you can change the water environment, um, having more sunshine and avoiding any exposure to heavy metals and solvents. Um, yeah, we have already spoken about these. But one thing I want to tell, I have uh, almost a dozen patients with gout and Parkinson's disease, but all the studies talk about high uric acid levels protective for Parkinson's. I don't understand this because I've seen patients with gout having Parkinson's disease. Next. This is just to explain how the neuroinflammation com with a compromised gut leads to brain involvement and leads to uh, Parkinson's disease. And these factors can be infections, uh, these can be toxins in the environment. Um, next one. Sleep is a major issue in Parkinson's disease patients. So daytime drowsiness and can't, unable to sleep at night. Um, and um, as I was uh, explaining, we have to know what type of disorder you are suffering. Some people have restless legs. You can have dopamine agonists like Cifrol, or you can be having iron deficiency. It could be rapid eye movement behavior disorder in which people enact in their dreams. Melatonin can help with that. Next. So sleep hygiene is important, following the sleep uh, circadian rhythm pattern and looking into the cause of what, what is affecting your sleep. Uh, one thing which has always worked for me in elderly people is that they get up at 4 or 4.30 and then they can't go to bed and they think it's bad. But if you look into the normal physiology of sleep, uh, REM sleep increases the shorter latency as we grow old. And awakenings are usually at 4.30 and which is not bad. Because some people who are retired, they go to bed at 8.30. How long can you stay in bed? So, so the thing is that it's just our notion that we have to be in bed till 7 a.m. You can be out at 4.30 and do what you have to do and see how many hours you are in bed. So stay in bed not more than eight hours. Some people are for 10 hours in bed and they sleep only for five hours and they think they are not sleeping well. So. Someone was asking about bright light therapy, and I see people coming with those helmets of blue light, red light, uh, and the white light. And, but I would say sunshine is the best light. So go out and expose your body to the sun. It, it actually increases your dopamine levels. That's what I would tell you. And use your power of mind. Be positive. Get all the information. Check with your uh, therapist uh, whether this is just a fake news or it really works and ask others who have tried it. Mental health, uh, look for, um, uh, get treated for your depression, anxiety, because it's very common in Parkinson's disease. Next, next. And social connectedness has been found to be very important, moving from denial to acceptance of disease, 
making connections and choosing the people who are in your recovery bus who can help you and look for effective support. Thank you. Next. Benefits of Parkinson's group program, individual programs. Next. Next. And these are the people who can help you. It's a long list of all the people, but mainly it's the medical specialist, Parkinson's nurse, GP, and uh, physio and OT who can help you. Next. So I'm running a Parkinson's retreat in uh, Melbourne, in Yarra Valley, from 12 to 14th of Jan. It's a, it's a weekend, and um, if someone wants to join, they can, they're most welcome. And this, these are some pictures of the place. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Sanjay. Any questions? Sorry, I have to rush because I think uh, I made too many slides, probably. <laughs> Any questions of Sanjay? Oh. My question is, is there certain jobs or employment or industries that prevalence of PD is higher? And then that leads on to, is there areas of, of Australia that prevalence of PD is higher? So the question is, are there certain jobs in which the prevalence of PD is higher? And also, are there certain areas in the country where the prevalence of PD is higher? Yeah, sure. It's a very good question. Uh, I think prevalence of PD is quite high in neurologists, I believe. I have seen <laughs> at least half a dozen. <laughs> so, um, look, uh, PD, if you look, uh, they have studied the personality of uh, Parkinson's patients. They are a bit obsessive about what they do. And they are thinkers. And usually they don't have any uh, vices and they are very clear people. So I don't think they take things lightly. And if you see evolutionary perspective of it, um, with arborization and using too much and not just taking it as a freedom of their mind and not thinking too much, I think that is one of the things which is being found. So highly educated people can develop Parkinson's This is more prone in that sense. And I think if you see even the smoking, who knows, it might be a spurious association, like you know, you're smoking, you, you don't care you know, how people think about you. And th that can be related with less incidence in Parkinson's. If you look into the regions where Parkinson's is more, they have always found uh, Parkinson's more in chemical industries like organic solvents, uh, trichloroethylene. And also um, in agriculture, places where uh, people are having well water or the water which is high in uh, metals, heavy metals like manganese, lead, uh, or copper. So environmental toxins um, or a job, a high pressure jobs probably. Hope this answers your question. Any other questions of Sanjay? Okay, I think. Hello, Sanjez. Um, I was just wanting to ask you, um, in my family, my mum had Parkinson's, my brother has Parkinson's and I have Parkinson's. And do you believe it can be genetic? Look, it's important that the family shares the same environment, so we can't say it is genetic. And it's also important to know at what age it was in your family. Can you tell me in what age? People had Parkinson's in your family? Oh, um, I was 59, my brother was 63, and my mum was diagnosed at 70. Yeah, I would say uh, fairly young, uh, young people also in family. So it could be genetic. I think genetic testing can be done, and we can find out if there's a gene mutation which is leading to it. But as I said, environmental factors can also play a role on genes as we 
talked about epigenetics. Any more questions? Thank you, everyone. Thanks for listening. Thank you.